and it's raining outside and potentially we're going to see snow tonight and that just kind of falls into what we expect during springtime in new england especially on any night that we want to get out and do astronomy but regardless we have a nice program set up for you guys tonight we have some images that we've captured this week we have some images that we've captured over the last year to show you we have some new stuff to talk about and we also have a special guest speaker tonight now i wanted to do a quick shout out to everyone who's been joining us on these friday night events we love that you guys are here we've put a, a lot of time into making this work and this is us bringing the cosmos to you from our homes to your home we're in this with you. We're all waiting for things to start to go back to normal. But until that happens, we're going to keep broadcasting every Friday night, stargazing events, and we're going to use live images whenever the skies permit it. Now, I also want to give a shout out to everyone who's been donating to Frosty Drew Observatory and Science Center during these live events. It is helping us amazingly to get through this time of having to stay closed. And even though this is our dead season and it is springtime in New England, so we always have clouds and rain affecting our programs, having these events has really, it's made us happy and it's become something that we look forward to because we get to communicate with you guys, we get to communicate with each other. And even though we're still home, it, it kind of reduces a lot of that isolation. So, on, the, on tonight's discussion, on tonight's event, we have Derek Schott, we have Gavin Olson, we have myself, Scott McNeil. We're going to be astronomers on the discuss, discussion. Our Sky Evangelists tonight, which are serving as moderators, is Lindsay Abrams and Jessica McNeil. If you look to the right side of your screen, you will see that the chat window is a place where you can open up a discussion with each other. You can open up a discussion with our moderators and you can pose questions for us. Our moderators will take your questions and they'll pose them on air to the astronomers to get answers for you. And we also tonight have our guest speaker, Bob Horton, who is the astronomy labs manager at the Brown University Department of Physics. He's also the manager of the lad observatory in providence rhode island and he happens to be my boss so we want to make sure that we're giving bob an excellent attention tonight now bob is going to talk to us about some of the fabulous photographs he has captured and how he does it of starscapes and constellations and then later tonight he's going to speak again about some of the amazing images he's captured of the international space station on nights that it passes over new england and he, did, he uses a 12-inch Newtonian reflector to do it. And the detail you can see on the International Space Station is astounding. Bob is a fabulous guy, and he is a legendary telescope maker in the region. So I'm going to hand the discussion over to Bob now, where he can tell you a little bit more about what he does. Hi, right, Scott. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, these are very interesting times that we're all living through, and I am very much looking forward to getting back out under the stars and joining other fellow stargazers. But at least we can all enjoy these activities solo or with close family members. The sky is still there. And I want to use this opportunity to encourage people to go out and just do some stargazing. Maybe for some of you who have not really explored the sky much. This is a good opportunity to go out and get a, a, a basic star atlas, maybe order a pair of binoculars and start exploring the sky. It's really a, a wonderful thing to do, a nice pastime. And it doesn't matter if you're living in a city or someplace where the sky is dark. The sky is always changing. There's always something that you can see. And there's some wonderful events coming up. Um, some of you may have already noticed the brilliant planet Venus shining in the west, and it's getting lower towards the western horizon night after night. That's because it is coming between us and the sun, and it's becoming more back, uh, more front lit. So we're seeing the nighttime side of Venus. It'll show up as a very thin crescent. And you don't need a telescope to see this. You can actually go out with a pair of 10-power binoculars. It will be tiny, 
but you'll be able to uh, see the distinct shape of that crescent phase. And I know Scott's been taking some wonderful shots of the planet Venus, and I'm hoping he'll show them a little bit later on tonight. So let me just pull up my PowerPoint, and I'm new to this platform, so you know, bear with me if there's a few hiccups along the way. Um, screen. So for some reason, I'm not getting that coming up. There you go. Is it showing up? I see it. Now you just got to full screen it. How's that look? Looks good. Okay, very good. So what I want to talk to you about is some very basic astrophotography. This is geared towards somebody that just has... Uh, a digital SLR and maybe a tripod. You don't need a telescope for this type of photography. Now I have access to all sorts of equipment. I have my own telescopes. I do enjoy uh, imaging through them, but this is a little more personal type of an experience going out into um, a middle of a field or a dark sky. And often what I do is I combine this with Stargazing. I'll bring a pair of binoculars with me and um, a, a, a couple of star charts and just explore a little bit while I'm taking these photographs. So I encourage anyone that, if, that has an interest in this to give it a try. This is all going to be very easy. Uh, I'm going to do, um, I'll describe a little bit of image processing, but everything about this is very minimal. Now, as far as your camera choices, you can use either um, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. The important thing is to have interchangeable lenses. So you can you know, create a field of view. Uh, if you're shooting uh, a little bit closer up of a constellation, you want nebulae and star clusters to show up. Or perhaps you want a wide angle lens. It's taking more of a landscape showing the sky above it. It doesn't mean you can't use a camera that has a fixed lens. You can still use those as well. It's just that you'll have you know, a greater range of what you can shoot by having interchangeable lenses. Another great choice is to look for older used lenses. Now I've bought lenses from B&H Photo or a KEH camera. Um, a lot of these older lenses that are manual focus work exceptionally well. If you have a more expensive autofocus lens, those are very good too. But the point is, when you're doing astrophotography, you shut the autofocus feature off because the camera has a very difficult time focusing on the stars. So if you're going to use the manual feature anyway, you can buy an older lens. In fact, one of my very favorite lenses for constellation photography is an older Nikkor 50 millimeter F2 lens, and I paid all of $50 for it. The other things that you're going to need certainly are a tripod, a pan or a ball head to support the camera. You'll need a remote control to activate the shutter. You should invest in extra batteries, particularly when it's cold, batteries don't last very long, so you always want to have extra batteries, and a red headlamp, just so you can see what you're doing. Now, Bob, do you need a, like, a? can you do this with any tripod, or does it have to be a specific type, like, like a telescope tripod, or a really sturdy tripod, or can you do it with, like, a $25 Amazon deal? No, I would say you need a fairly sturdy tripod. Now, you don't need something as rigid that would support a telescope that might cost hundreds of dollars, but you can get you know, perfectly good tripods for 100 to maybe $200. There are some very inexpensive ones, um, but they tend to be flimsy, and I would avoid that. So I don't know if you can get one for $25, 
perhaps you can use. Um, but the important thing is that it's sturdy. Okay. I've also noticed too that the you got a one of the guys in your presentation there has got a red light on him. I, we see a lot of red lights at observatories. We see a lot of red lights with the night photographers that know what they're doing. Why, why a red light? Why not just a regular white light? Well, the red light affects your night vision far less. So under dark conditions, our pupils di will dilate and allow more light in. So if you put on a white light, your pupils are going to close right up and you're going to have a tough time seeing the stars. So that'll help preserve your night vision by using a red light. So red lights are... Just remember to shut it up. Yeah, make sure you shut it off when you're taking your photograph. I've actually have forgotten to do that on a couple of times. <laughs> so let me just continue on. So no matter what camera lens you have, learn how to use the manual settings on your camera. A lot of people get cameras, and of course the cameras can do a million things. The, the instruction book is thick. Um, there's a lot of tricks that that camera can do that you don't need it to do. Look up in that manual on how to set the camera to a manual settings because you don't want the camera determining what the white balance might be or, or the ISO or even attempt to focus. So you want to learn how to actually manually focus that lens, learn how to adjust the white balance and choose the ISO uh, for what you're trying to photograph. Another thing to consider is planning your shots. Try to visualize how you want the photograph to look and check for upcoming astronomical events. Get a magazine, um, Sky and Telescope magazine or Astronomy magazine will alert you to what's going to be going on in the sky in the month to come. I also like using planetarium software like Stellarium or Starry Night. There are also plenty of free phone apps that you can download to help you find your way around the sky. Do you have a uh, recommended phone app, Bob? Um, yeah, there's one that it was actually free. Uh, Celestron you put out. <laughs> now I got to check on it because I can't remember what it's called. And let me just see what's on my phone. I know Sky Safari is a pretty popular one, right? Yeah, I use that and uh, Sky Portal. Sky Portal is a, a good one. But there's, there's lots of them out there. So whatever, you know, check them out and see what you're liking. I also like yeah. to try to decide on the locations of where I might want to photograph. So if like there's a, a full moon rising, maybe I want to get it uh, rising over a lighthouse and I'll want to check out various locations. So you can go on Google Earth and actually check out the sky on Google Earth, uh, uh, what the location is going to look like, and even determine uh, uh, the azimuth and, and things like that. Now, I'll start off with starry nights. And just to show you how I work this towards a photograph I'm about to show you, this was from January 31st, 2018. This shows the uh, blue moon rising. Now, the moon isn't blue, it's only called that because whenever there are two full moons in the same month, the second one's referred to as a blue moon. So if you go in the starry nights, you can see what time it's gonna rise, and if you click on the moon, it'll give you some information about uh, its rising time, what time it's gonna set, and the azimuth, which is very important. Once you know the location of where it's gonna rise in the horizon, you can check that against Google Earth. Um, lots of phones have a feature on them where, like, on Sky Portal, if I bring up the sky, that free app on my phone, and I use the compass feature, as I move that field around and aiming in different parts of the sky, it'll tell me exactly where I am pointing and azimuth. So I can determine where, like, the moon's going to rise before it actually does and be prepared to take my photograph. So this is out of Google Earth. Well, here's a cool feature I can turn on. Hold on. I just discovered this today. Can you see the laser pointer? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, isn't that great? I think this is just so cool. I can use this laser pointer. 
So I was set up down by the Beaver Tail Lighthouse, and I knew from Google Earth that the moon rises over the Castle Hill Inn. So when I actually arrived, I used that free phone app to determine the azimuth precisely. And originally, I was set up in the parking lot where I'm pointing the laser pointer to, and I could tell by using that phone app that the moon was going to be from that position a little bit too far to the left. So as I moved down closer to the lighthouse, it showed that I was lining up perfectly. So here's the moon rising. I was all set for it. This was an exceptionally cold night. So I was doing my best just not to freeze to death. The scene conditions weren't the best. The moon is a bit distorted uh, from that turbulent air. But here it is rising in between the Castle Hill Inn and the Castle Hill Lighthouse. So let's talk a little bit about some very basic shots. Now, you don't need a telescope mount with a motor drive on it. This is strictly a camera with a camera release, a shutter release. The camera is mounted on a tripod. We can head out into the field. There are some limitations. If you're not going to be tracking and you want to avoid star trailing, you can use this very simple method with a full frame camera, and that's what FX means. If you take 500 and divide it by the focal length, that will be your exposure limit. Anything exceeding that, the stars will begin to show some trailing. The photograph in the upper left hand corner is actually, I took that with a medium format film camera. That's a six hour exposure showing how much the stars move in that time. Now, if you have a, a DX format camera, which has a smaller chip, just use 335 and divide that by the focal length of the lens, and that will be your exposure limit. So on a full frame camera, a 50 millimeter lens, I'm limited to 10 seconds. And the equivalent focal length on a DX camera is 35 millimeters. That's also 10 seconds. When you get into the wide angle lenses, you can go quite a bit more. So you can go about 25 seconds with a 20 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. This might be slightly generous. Um, depends on the resolution of your camera. So even though it says 10 seconds with a 50 millimeter lens, I'll just cut it back by one second. I think I've noticed just ever so slight trailing at 10 seconds. Back to Starry Night, I'll often uh, determine the field of view of the camera. And if there's a particular constellation or perhaps there's gonna be a planetary alignment, I'll check out how that shot's gonna look before I actually go out into the field to make sure I'm taking the lenses that I want. If I want to shoot something a little bit closer up so I can resolve nebulae and clusters, I might use a small telephoto lens as shown in this star field. So now I'm heading out into the field. This was actually taken up in New Hampshire. Now everybody has some magical place that they really enjoy. Perhaps you visited a national park or a state park, or you have a favorite family vacation place that you go to. This just happens to be, you know, a favorite place uh, of my family's. Uh, so this is out in the middle of a very large field, just before the sandwich range of mountains in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And this gives me a, a beautiful view, pretty much 360 degrees. The mountains are to our north. And in this shot, I'm overlooking a very wide field, and that bright object is the planet Mars. It was at opposition at that time, back in, well, I think it was 2018. <laughs> Often in June, this field is filled with lupins that are blooming, and it'll just be filled with fireflies as well. So that's why it's such a very special place to me. This was done with a wide-angle lens, and I've boosted the ISO up to 8,000 just so I can get as much of the Milky Way in this shot as possible without any tracking, just a still shot. 
Now, there are some limitations to doing this. When you boost the ISO, you'll record more, but you'll also record a lot of electronic noise that the camera is going to produce. So it's preferable to shoot with a lower ISO. But it's still a very nice shot. You can see the Milky Way and there's some clouds in, in the view. We've got pretty dark skies there, except for just due south, you can see there's some light pollution that's near the horizon. I was going to ask you, Bob, if that was light pollution or if it was sunrise or sunset. Yeah, unfortunately, it's light pollution. And 25 years ago, there was, there was no light pollution there. It's wow. getting difficult to get away from light pollution. Another favorite place I like to go to is cellophane. Usually every summer, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, cellophane just announced that they were canceling for this year. Hopefully, everyone can go uh, to this wonderful event next year. Oh, that's terrible. I, just, I didn't hear that yet. Yeah, they've, unfortunately, they've canceled. So I often go there, and if I've got a telescope that I've worked on and made the optics, I'll enter it in competition. Bob often wins there. Let me just put that into there. <laughs> well, just twice. No, I wouldn't say often. I've won twice. <laughs> Whenever he enters. Let's put it that way. All right. <laughs> so on this particular night, this is during twilight, and, and this is an actual observatory. I know it looks like a very strange contraption. The building in the background is their original clubhouse that was built in the early 1920s. And I believe their group was formed in 1923, and they had their first cellophane in 1926. This year was the first year they've had to cancel since World War II. So it's pretty sad. And hopefully we will get back to it next year. Now, this is a very unique observatory. This structure on the outside of the dome is the structure that supports the secondary mirror where I'm shining the laser pointer. Actually, no, that's where the primary mirror goes. And when this was taken, they had mounted the, the mirror in this. I think it was a 12-inch mirror. You can see this other diagonal in here. This is where the secondary mirror is mounted, and it has a perforation in it. So this can be rotated, this mirror, and this turret actually rotate so you can take this structure and put it anywhere in the sky so that light will hit this flat mirror go down to the primary and then it gets focused bends the light it ends up going through a hole in the secondary and inside that turret now this is all made out of concrete and this thing turns like a tank it's got this enormous gear Inside the building, they use this during the winter and it's heated. So you can sit inside very comfortably and just use their mechanical setting circles to line the telescope up to what you're trying to view. Now, when I took this shot, somebody was just leaving the site. There's a road off to the left. And as they went down the hill, they tapped their brakes and it just lit up the turret and the clubhouse and it just illuminated it. So it really made it jump out. Another favorite place is Seagrave Observatory in North Situate. And we were set up there, I forget what year this was, a few years ago. We had a total eclipse of the moon, and that's what's right here in the sky. You can see quite a few stars in this photograph. And this is simply a 10-second exposure. And you can see the main observatory that contains an 8-inch Alvin Clark refractor. And there's a roll-off building here that has a 16-inch mead in it. Now, Bob, does what does Seagrave Observatory offer a public night where visitors can go and check out the, the equipment and look at the, the cosmos? It's typically open on Saturday night. And just like everyone else, unfortunately, it's closed down due to the pandemic. Hopefully things will change soon. We'll all get to get get back together again. Here's another shot of Seagrave, and of course I do enjoy photographing the space station when it flies over. I've got a, a few shots of that, plus the other presentation I'll show a little bit later. So this is with a 20 millimeter lens, and you can see the space station uh, moving out of the handle of the Big Dipper and moving to nearly overhead in just 19 seconds time. 
So this type of photography is about recording events. It's just a great keepsake. You go out to do some stargazing. Um, and that's really what I think the primary activity should be, is just to go out there and do some viewing. If you're going to do some astrophotography with your camera, just plan on taking a few shots, but make sure you're enjoying viewing the stars and um, maybe learning about a few new objects along the way. Now, this isn't from the most recent view of Venus. I actually took this a few years ago, but this is very similar to what we're all witnessing now. Venus is getting lower in the sky during twilight, and it is absolutely brilliant. It's so bright that you'll actually see it reflecting light in water. So I really happen to like this shot a lot. Now, this is a pretty cool shot. Now, this is one I plan... Um, in my mind, I was going to be taking a series of shots of the moon passing over the state house as it went down towards the horizon. And it only entered into eclipse into the shadow of the okay. earth. When okay. It... I found this on the web for of shot passing over the state house. As oh, it went hold down on. Towards the... <laughs> Siri just overheard me and started talking. I don't know why. Um, so this is the, the moon entering into eclipse just before it set. And it was an exceptionally cold morning. And I took a series of shots. I wasn't particularly crazy about any of them. And as I was leaving, heading back to my car, all these people had shown up and they were watching this. We're all sharing the moment. And I didn't even have my camera on my tripod at this point. This is just a handheld shot of everyone gathered in Prospect Park overlooking the city of Providence and watching the eclipse moon setting. Bob, we have some people writing in on the chat that they think your pictures are beautiful. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> I would definitely agree with that assessment. My mouse is working a little bit funky, so all right. Another thing I want to point out, sometimes, um, Things don't work out like you expect. Now, for this shot, I had gotten up early one morning. I knew there'd be a grouping of planets in the morning sky, and I wanted to get a shot of it over the Situate Reservoir. It was clear at my house, but when I got to the site, the clouds had rolled in. And I thought about just turning around, but I noticed some breaks in the clouds. And that's the planet Venus. It's actually making the fringes of the cloud light up so use that as an opportunity too and you can get some very dramatic results uh so don't allow yourself to get discouraged if um you get into certain conditions see what you can do with it so what is lighting up the bottom of the clouds in that previous picture i would love to tell you that it was the early dawn it would be really nice to say that but this is looking towards the east, and that is light pollution from Cranston and Providence and Warwick, probably. So that's what that is. How nice of them. But the blue okay. fringing, that's from the planet Venus. Yeah, it's interesting the way that the cloud structure gets shadowed by the, the light angle. It, it, was really, nice effect. it was really beautiful just to see in person. Also, whenever the moon's out, it might be a full moon. The sky's very bright. Obviously, you can't take as long an exposure because it'll wash out the, the scenery. But it's a good opportunity to have your landscape illuminated by the moon. This is a very recent shot, just taken last month when Venus was near the Pleiades. And this is just down the road from me at a, a small pond in Foster. This is also a recent photograph taken down at the Situate Reservoir, and this is the morning planets right now. This is Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter. And I framed it so I got the reflections in the water, and I think the color is more obvious. Look at the red color from Mars. It actually has a very ruddy coloration to it. Saturn, to me, looks a little bit yellowish, and it certainly is, has a yellow tint in a telescope. 
whereas Jupiter appears very white. Yeah, that's really cool. You can also... No. Yep, go ahead. Uh, so is there, if there's anything that you wanted to tell somebody who is just starting out, what would probably be the most important piece of information for them? Like they just got a camera, they got a tripod, they want to go out and shoot the stars. The most important thing, okay. Um, again, learn how to use it in manual settings. Make sure it's focused. That's the most critical thing. So you're going to use live view, obviously, to see what you're looking at. And there's usually a magnifying button on cameras. I imagine that all modern cameras have that. You should be able to magnify that image, find a bright star or a planet that's in the scene, and then very carefully turn the barrel of your camera lens and make sure it's critically focused. That, that's the most important thing. There's also um, a fairly cool um, mask you can put on the end of uh, most camera lenses and telescopes that actually ends up turning your uh, optical um, your optics into kind of an optical computer. It's called a Batonov mask. Um, I use them for um, my camera lenses because it's kind of difficult to understand if you're in focus or close to focus. And the Batonov max masks do a really cool thing where they they generate uh, a static cross across the star and then a dynamic line that moves through that cross. And when the line is centered in the cross, you're in perfect focus. Yeah, I've used those too. Um, I, I find it's a little more critical to use them on a telescope. I don't find I really need it on a like a 50 millimeter camera lens. Hmm. Certainly use it. You know, it is a helpful device. But yeah. I think if one's just careful um, and get a somewhat bright star in the field, you can magnify that. You can very quickly tell just by rotating the, the barrel on the camera lens, even slightly, how you get color fringing will change. If it's, you know, if it's a little bit out of focus one way, you might see a little bit of a red fringe. And if it's out mm -hmm. of focus the way, a little bit of a blue fringe, you can really zero in on it. Now, another trick you can do without any complication of a tracking mount, still with the camera on the tripod, is to do composites and panoramics. This requires a little bit of work in Photoshop, but the settings are often just automatic. You can actually stack images. Now for this shot of the Perseid media shower, this was actually two separate frames stacked. So one frame had this meteor in it and the second frame had this meteor. The experience of being there and seeing meteors fall at a rate of maybe one every couple of minutes was you know, dramatic. So I didn't want to just show a photograph of just a single meteor because that's not the experience I had. Now, I know Scott has taken some shots, and he'll spend hours doing this and then combine all of them and show, you know, 60 meteors streaking across the sky. So this is just an example of putting two images together, and it's done very easily. This is a panoramic. This was actually taken, I think, with like five different frames, moving the camera from left to right. So this is a good 90 degrees of sky. Over here, this is in the northeast, and we're looking all the way to the southeast. The bright object near the horizon is the planet Mars. There's a couple of satellites moving while that frame is shot. You can see this dark rift going through the Milky Way. The North American Nebula is right up in here. And there's some green sky glow. This is actually upper atmosphere that's glowing through the energy from the sun, making the gases glow. And this was also a wonderful experience. When all the planets were lined up in the morning sky back in February of 2016, I went down to Beaver Tail Park, which is one of my favorite places to go for astronomical events. And there was snow on the ground. It was a very cold morning, um, but it was well worth going to. Soon after the moon rose, you could see the planet Mercury very close to the horizon. And in the original photograph, it is easier to see than what might be shown here in this presentation. 
Um, but I can see Mercury. We have the glow of the moon shining on the water. There's a very faint glow of Venus shining on the water, too, if you look at that carefully. Then we have Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter. And this was a combination of six frames that were stitched together. Now I'm, I'll talk a little bit about taking longer exposures. So we still don't want star trails. And this is going to require some sort of amount that will compensate for the Earth's rotation. Bob, not... could I ask a question about the other picture you had just had up? Yeah, go um, right how, on. how often does that happen on where you can see that many planets in the sky at once? That's a really good question. I'm not sure how often that happens. It seems that throughout my uh, my years of observing the sky, it's happened fairly often, but I don't know how often the occurrence is. Um, I would say every few years at least. But I'll, I'll have to look that up. That's a really good question. Cool. So we'll talk about taking longer exposure. What are the benefits of that? Well, we're going to be able to record uh, many fainter stars. We can actually reduce the ISO in the camera, so that it'll be less noisy. We're going to get um, this better-looking photograph. But in order to do this, we have to be able to track the motion of the sky. You don't have to go out and buy an expensive mount that is used typically with a telescope. For a camera, you can get away with something that's very lightweight. Now, this shows the camera in its pouch next to the ball head that I use. And this bag is probably about the size of, um, well, a small case that binoculars would come in. So not very large at all. I use this. I put it in a backpack along with my camera and maybe one lens and my tripod. This allows me to get into places that might have some beautiful scenery, but I can't access them by car. So I can walk in on foot. I've used this at remote locations when I've hiked them up in the mountains, and I've really enjoyed using it. It runs off of pen light batteries. So this is a device removed from the pouch, and the bottom side of this is threaded, and that just threads onto the top of a, any camera tripod. It's a standard thread. So here it is mounted. This piece here, when this is turned on, this will slowly rotate. So this acts as an equatorial mount. So it will compensate for the Earth's rotation and keep the camera pointing at the stars as everything appears to move in the sky. So we have this thing mounted on the tripod. You adjust it to your latitude. And it has a scale on this. So you have that adjustment, and then you have another knob down here so you can rotate it in azimuth. It also has a, an alignment telescope that allows you to align towards Polaris. This is to get it sighted so that this mount is, has this axis that is um, perpendicular, I mean, parallel to the Earth rotational axis. So if you were behind it and drew an imaginary line through this, this would point very close to Polaris once it's lined up. And this shows it with the ball head attached and the camera on it. Once this is lined up, you don't move the tripod or rotate this or change that angle. All the motions are done by rotating this ball head to point the camera where I want to look. To get it actually pointed to the pole, you view through the polar alignment scope, and it has a reticle with numbers on it. And you're going to place Polaris somewhere on this inner circle. So how do you determine that? Well, the manufacturer gives you a free phone app, and it'll pick up your location and time. So no matter where you are using it, it'll tell you where to position Polaris at that moment that you're using it. And in this example, it's very close to the number five here. Now, Bob, is this application, does this work with all star trackers, or do you have to have an application for each star tracker? I'm not familiar with other manufacturers. They probably have something very similar. 
this just happens to be one that, that I use. And we're talking now that, you know, these things cost maybe around $300 and not very expensive. And do you feel like the Ioptron tracker works well for you? This one has worked very well for me. I've had good results with it. Okay. Other people might disagree. I think with any of these products, uh, the quality control, some of them are hit or miss. So, But it's a good company. So if you get one that had some problem in being manufactured, you can just send it back in and they'll swap it for another one. So the other trick I like to use is diffusion filters. Now, it seems strange. Everyone's trying to find the sharpest quality lens, the best optics, so you get really sharp images. And then you take this piece of glass that has a slight frosting to it, and you put it in front of the lens. So why would you do that? Well, it's not an original idea. Anyone that's been reading Sky and Telescope magazine for decades has probably seen shots by Akara Fuji from Japan. And he took a lot of these shots on film, of course, and I think he's still active taking shots with digital cameras using this very method. Now, the reason for putting a diffusion filter in front of your camera for longer exposures is that it accentuates the brighter stars. It actually will broaden light out a little bit. It also accentuates the color of those stars. And it makes the familiar pattern of the constellation stand out against the fainter stars. Without the diffusion filter, a long exposure shot, many of the fainter stars look almost equal in brightness to the familiar stars of the constellation, and the, and the constellation becomes hidden in the view. So to show you some examples of constellations with and without the filter, I did some testing. I went out, put the camera on a tripod. I'm not tracking now. I'm just strictly Find it out with the filter and without the filter. So here's the Big Dipper. You can see the spoon of it and the handle. And this is just a 14 second shot. And in this shot, you can see all faint stars that you don't normally see. So you have the regular pattern of the constellation and all these additional stars. By putting a filter in front of it, the faintest stars still look sharp and then the brighter stars become a little more accentuated. So these are the pointer stars of the Big Dipper. We have Marak and Duhi. And you can see the color difference too. This one's fairly yellow. This is a giant star, it's a K-class star. Um, and all the rest of these are probably A stars. I know Marak is an A star. Very blue, white, very hot star. And for those who are not familiar with this, if you draw an imaginary line through these two stars and go onward, off the frame here would be Polaris. So these two stars always point at Polaris. A couple more test shots. Here is the constellation of Sagittarius. Looks like a teapot. You have the spout, the lid, and this is the handle. And the Milky Way looks like steam coming out of the spout. And when I took this shot, the planet Saturn was right above the constellation. That's that bright object. Now, when you mentioned Sagittarius and you showed us the teapot, it, Sagittarius is supposed to be the archer, not the teapot. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at a portion of the constellation, the brightest stars, and that's referred to as an asterism. So there are fainter stars in combination with these that form the archer but the brighter stars have this more familiar pattern and to me it looks like a teapot it's one of my I favorite see it. so it's more obvious when i put the diffusion filter in front of it that oh pattern, yeah that pattern becomes very familiar okay so i want to show you some shots i took the camera is on the ioptron tracker now I'm using the diffusion filter. And many of these are shot under a very dark sky up in New Hampshire. So you're gonna get some really good results. This is easy photography again. Once you get this thing polar line, you don't have to worry about auto guiders or any sort of tracking or corrections. Just aim the camera 
As long as it's in good focus, while it's taking a shot, you can explore the sky with some binoculars. I often will set up, I bring a little folding chair, and I have my binoculars, and I explore the sky while the camera is doing its work. So here's a, a shot of the Little Dipper showing far more stars than the eye would see. This is only 117 seconds at ISO 1600. I'll point out the familiar pattern. There's Polaris, and here's the handle, and here's the spoon of the Little Dipper. And notice all the different star colors, too. Without the filter, I don't think they're quite as obvious. But these colors are real, and they're all dependent on the temperature of the star. The, the bluer the star, the higher the temperature. And a lot of these colors that you're capturing here is a result of that diffusion filter, right? It is. I mean, they're, the colors are there without the filter, but they're far more obvious with it. And so is the pattern that we're familiar with uh, that makes up the Little Dipper. Now, this is kind of a close-up of Polaris. I just want to point this out because I recently picked up a book um, called Binocular Highlights by Gary Saronic. Sky and Telescope puts it out. Wonderful book. And even after all these years of looking at the sky, I never noticed a feature that he points out in that book. He says, when you look at Polaris with binoculars, he calls this the engagement ring. Polaris looks like a diamond, and there's a little circle of faint stars. I'm going to just kind of draw with a laser pointer there. And it's even better in binoculars because that's what you see. It actually looks like a ring of light little beads of um, diamond dust and with a big stone on, on that setting. So give that a try sometime. It's funny that all these years, I never noticed it until I read this book. I've never noticed that before either, but now is probably going to be what I see every time. Yeah, so check it out. He calls it the engagement ring. I think it's wonderful. Often when I'm shooting the constellations, I try to get some trees or a landmark, something in the scene, just to give you a sense of scale. So this is just a big bear up in an oak tree. So we have the handle of Ursa Major, and you can see the spoon of it. This is also with a diffusion filter. It's a somewhat shorter exposure because I didn't want the, the tree itself to end up getting blurred because the camera's mount is tracking the stars so the stars don't trail but everything on the land is going to appear to be moving and it will blur in a longer exposure so here's something very dramatic this is pointing towards the summer milky way near the horizon and this was in august of 2018 and the planet saturn was in sagittarius this is Scorpius, and this is Antares, the brightest star. You can see it's very orange in color. But I just love all these dark rifts in the Milky Way. This is obscuring dust that blocks out the view of the stars that are behind it. And you can see the brilliant Milky Way here. Um, this is M7. It's a beautiful star cluster. It shows up really nicely in binoculars. Another star cluster is M6. So while you're taking shots like this, you can just be exploring the sky with binoculars. This is a very rich area. There's the Lagoon Nebula, the Triffid, there's some star clusters. So all you have to do is just point the binoculars into the Milky Way and just sweep upward, and you'll see one object after another. So this is in 2018, and this is almost uh, the same scene a year later. Saturn has moved from this position over to here, and Jupiter has now joined the view at that time. Again, you can see the dark lanes in the Milky Way, you even have a little faint meteor. Now, Bob, why do we see the planet's positions change like that? No, because the planets are orbiting the sun and they're always moving. So year after year, we're gonna see them in a different part of the sky. And just to show you how much they've changed since last year, I have this shot from Starry Night. So we had, last year we had um, Saturn about in this position and Jupiter here. They've moved quite a bit towards the east. 
So they're more into uh, the constellation of Capricorn now. I think Jupiter is right on the border with Sagittarius and Capricorn. So eventually, what we're seeing now in the last couple of years in the summer sky, Saturn and Jupiter will eventually be in the winter sky. That's right. They're Right now, they're leaving the summer sky, and I define the summer sky as this region. The last couple of years, they've been in this region. Now they're going more in towards the fall. So this is essentially still the summer, but we'll get to enjoy this right into the early fall as well. It'll be well-placed for viewing. A year from now, they'll be further east, and they'll definitely be more of, of a fall object at that point, not in the summer anymore. This is the constellations of Hercules and Corona Borealis. Um, maybe a little more challenging to see it because of all the faint stars, but these four are referred to as the keystone. Again, you can see the color differences. This one looks very yellow, but this is white. This one's blue. And there's a kind of a faint fuzzy object right there. That is the globular star cluster M13, the great Hercules cluster. So this is something that you can easily record with a 50 millimeter lens. And Corona Borealis is supposed to be a wreath. I just think it's a, a beautiful asterism. I like the, the change of colors in the stars. Beautiful, rich star field. And anyone who's watching right now, Please feel free to ask questions in the chat on the right side of your screen. You can pose questions that we can that our moderators will pose to us over the broadcast and to Bob. So please don't be afraid to ask questions. Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions as I go along. Uh, last year I had a nice view of the space station appearing in the western sky soon after uh, twilight. This is the constellation Taurus. The planet Mars at the time was in between the Pleiades and, and Taurus. And this is a 78-second exposure. So this is the distance the space station moved during that exposure. And you can notice the tree line is slightly blurred because of the length of the exposure. And I just have a few more. This is also part of the Milky Way in the summer. These are little constellations. This is Delphinus, the dolphin. Sajida the arrow is right up in here. And this is Aquila the eagle, with Altair being the brightest star. Again, look at all the different colors that appear. During the summertime, the constellation of Cygnus is nearly overhead. The bright star is Deneb. And there's a red patch of nebulosity here. If you look at it, the shape very carefully, I'll take the laser pointer away. It is called the North American Nebula just because of its shape. And hopefully you can see that. Yep. There's, there's some other patches of nebulosity here. You see all these dust lanes running through this region. Again, this is just a wonderful area to sweep with binoculars. And this is a more recent shot just last month. This is Orion setting, leaving our evening sky. The winter constellations are pretty much gone now. So that's my farewell shot. We'll see Orion again coming up sometime in October in the early morning sky. Now, Bob, back on the Orion picture, what's with the red star just below the Orion's belt? Oh, that's a good question. So you're referring to this? Yep. And you can say that that there's a funny red patch. It's not really defined nice and round like the stars. That's the great Orion Nebula that's showing up in this photo. So in a pair of binoculars, you can see it as a gassy cloud. And with a small telescope, you can definitely see some shape to it and some stars that are actually embedded within that nebula. And that's uh, naked eye visible? That's under dark conditions, you can see it. But you have to get away from the light pollution. Certainly with a pair of binoculars, even in a city sky, you can make out the Orion Nebula. Yeah, Bob, we have a question here from Brian. What's your favorite yeah. object to view with binoculars? I would say the 
probably two different things, the Pleiades in the winter sky and the Andromeda galaxy. In fact, I think the view of the Andromeda galaxy is better in binoculars than it is in a telescope, just because it's such a wide field of view. It's a, a large object, and a, a telescope only allows you to see just the central region of it in one view. Uh, the same night that I took the shot of Orion, I just swung the camera a little bit to the right, and this is with a diffusion filter again. It's exaggerating Venus, but it gives you the sense of just how bright it is. And you can see the blue colored stars of the Pleiades and the orange star of Aldebaran in the constellation of Taurus. And just a few more shots. This is Cassiopeia. This is also a portion of the Milky Way. It's not as pronounced as what you might see down in Scorpius and Sagittarius. But it's a nice, rich area. There's a nice star cluster down here, which is also a very fine object in binoculars. It's referred to as a double cluster because there are two star clusters side by side. And then over here, you can see a faint smudge of light. That's the Andromeda galaxy. Under a dark sky, you can see that naked eye. And that is the most distant thing humans can see without any optical aid over two and a half million light years away. Now this is with a camera trained on the constellation of Andromeda, which is this row of stars here and another row of stars here. It looks like a long V. And if you're familiar with the constellations and you can find this bright star and just go over one, two, and then go up one more star, and just above that, that's where the Andromeda galaxy can always be found. Splendid object in binoculars or a, a very small telescope. Now, this camera mount, oh. the camera mount I use is capable of supporting a telephoto lens. Just want to show you how the Andromeda galaxy looks like if I put a telephoto lens on the camera. So now this is a single shot. I boosted the ISO up to 12,800. I've done no fancy image processing. I boosted the contrast a little bit, the brightness a little, but very minimal, really. And it's only a 40 second exposure. Look at the detail one can capture. Now this is just a little tracking mount that I can put in a backpack and go anywhere with. So you don't need a very expensive telescope. We can see the spiral structure of the galaxy. One of the companion galaxies right here and another one here. I think that might be my last slide. That. Bob, those are some amazing images you had in there. Well, thanks. Now, if, yeah. Hey, Scott. Real quick, uh, Brian wanted to know um, if you could tell us some more about your uh, homemade binoculars. These are my homemade binoculars right here. These are made from a Nikon 2X teleconverters. You can get these on eBay or Amazon Marketplace. And I 3D printed a shell that you can get from, hey, Bob, can you stop sharing your desktop? I got the, you can 3D print a shell at any of the public libraries in Rhode Island. Just about all of them have 3D printers and they're available to the public to use. And you just kind of plug these teleconverters in and you can get a 2X view of the night sky. This is my current iteration the next iteration is going to be wearable and when i go to schools to talk to the children if they're not in the classroom and they come in while i'm there waiting for them i'll just kind of put them on my face like this and when all the kids walk in they think that they're my glasses and if they kind of get freaked out but i feel like i've gotten the best view of the night sky through these because even though they don't offer intense amounts of magnification. They do boost up that background level just enough 
to be able to see thousands of stars, which would normally just be like a gray background without them. Hey, Bob, can you kill your uh, screen sharing? I thought I did. So there we go. So Bob, is if there was, so you're using an icon camera, you're using your star tracker, sometimes using just your tripod. Could you do this kind of stuff with like your mom's point and shoot if you swiped it out of her pocketbook? Probably not. You know, those are all automated. I don't know if they really have manual settings. Probably not. So I've got an example of something you can do with some of the some with a cell phone. If anybody wants to see that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that'd be cool. Let's see. So this is actually everybody should uh, recognize the location this was uh, taken with. Uh, of course. Hold on. Got a line things up so that the uh, screen that I want to share can be seen. And we need to go over, here we go. All right, so share. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yep. All right, so this is a photograph of Frosty Drew um, taken in the summer. And you can see the constellation uh, Sagittarius back here. And then you can ever, ever so slightly see this fuzz that is the Milky Way. And this was taken with um, my cell phone uh, balanced on the fence uh, that is right behind the greeter's table. And you can see the moon is super bright over here. Uh, so the fact that we got anything with a cell phone on that night is pretty phenomenal. And you can see all the people moving around in the yard. So I like, I like this photo. It shows us kind of like an action shot of Frosty Drew. This is definitely not social distancing. <laughs> no, this is two years ago in July. So, uh, yeah. That is a remarkable photo. Did you have to download any special apps to um, adjust the exposure on it? or So the, de the default camera app on the Samsung S7 has a pro mode, uh, which allows you to lock the focus at infinity and do um, a 10-second exposure. And it also saves a raw in the form of a, a digital negative, a DNG file. So I took five on a timed uh, countdown and then stacked those and then stretched a little bit to get this photo. Well, I think it's remarkable. Now, Bob, when you're out in the field shooting those fabulous night photographs you're capturing, how do you deal with things like dew or like just the moisture in the air? I mean, it must get on your lenses. You don't want to wipe that off, do you? No, you don't want to because you can damage the coatings. Um, you can take, uh, if you use like hand warmers, you can you actually put one of those on your lens with an elastic band. Um, for really long exposures, how I deal with do is I use essentially a dew zapper. I made one out of a, a string of resistors I soldered together and attach that to a battery pack and just keep the lens warm. So pretty much the same treatment that you would use on a, like a schmidt cassegrain telescope on a smaller scale. Excellent. If, 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 you, you, were have, if, if you have like a hair dryer, could you use that? Well, make sure it's not too hot. That's the only thing. Yeah, I think you can use it, hold it from a, a fair distance. You don't want to overheat the lens and potentially damage it. I know years ago, I won't say where or who, but there was a certain <laughs> six-inch refractor that somebody was trying to heat up. I was told with a heat gun, they probably thought that was a good idea to get the dew off, and the lens was cracked in the front. <laughs> well, so, I've seen people using heat guns at Frosty Drew to get the dew yeah, off of their equipment. Don't do that. Don't do it. We have a question from Joan. Um, she's saying, have you been able to capture the northern lights in photos? I have, but I have not seen northern lights in so long that all my shots of them are on film. So I have not had an opportunity to shoot 
with any of my digital cameras. Now, for years, I shot with film. I only started using digital maybe 10 years ago. Um, the first digital cameras that came out just weren't all that great. And I was probably one that hung on the film a little bit longer than most. But um, I'm prepared and ready. I have some very nice wide-angle lenses. I'm hoping the solar activity will pick up and we'll have that opportunity again soon. So I'm going to share an image real quick in response to that question, which was captured by one of Frosty Drew's friends named Christine Rhubarb. She's an excellent night photographer, and she came out a few years on a night where we had the Aurora. We had a KP7 geomagnetic storm, and that's generally what we would need to see the, the Aurora in Rhode Island. And she took this picture at Frosty Drew. I believe this was September 12th, maybe 2014. I'm not too sure. And we had the Aurora show up like this for about 10 minutes. And this was the best shot I saw of that night. And we caught one at Frosty Drew as well, but it wasn't as good as this one. So, and though when we looked at this, you didn't see the purples, you didn't see the reds to the naked eye being as far south as we are, what we would see is just bands of gray in the sky. And in between it, you can see the dark lines. And what you were seeing was the, the, the contrast between where the aurora was visible and where it wasn't. A lot of the places where Bob captures his photos up in New Hampshire, up there, you don't just see the grays. You'll see the greens and you'll see the reds. I mean, it's very much, much more visible up there. And a quick note on that is whenever the aurora is visible and we think it's going to be visible in Rhode Island or in the new, the new England area, we'll post about it on social media, but keep this in mind that there's a really basic rule that you should follow. Don't ever drive South to see the Northern lights. <laughs> and frosty drew is located on the South coast of Rhode Island. We only got about maybe a quarter of a mile more South beneath us before you're in the water. So if you drove to Frosty Drew to see the Aurora, you went the wrong way. And occasionally we'll have people that come from Boston all the way down to Frosty Drew to catch the Aurora. And I remind them that if you drove the same distance the other way, you'd be rocking the Aurora right now. Yeah, absolutely. Joan replied to that and she said, nice. <laughs> so she <laughs> likes the picture. <laughs> it is possible to get very dramatic auroral displays in Rhode Island. I've seen them in the past. Um, again, it's been quite a few years since we've had a good one, but I've seen them cover almost the entire sky um, with bright colors too, brilliant reds, uh, with really good curtain structure in them and flashes of light rippling through them. Uh, they can put on quite a dramatic show, but it requires a lot of solar activity. And for anyone that's been observing the sun, you know that it's very, very quiet. There's very little detail to be seen on the sun lately. So I have, I'm going to show a quick video that I captured this past Tuesday of Venus. Now we're in a period right now where Venus is all the rage. We have some excellent views happening of Venus. And it's because Venus continues to wane. Now, you notice that Bob had a lot of images of Venus, and every week we've been showing footage of Venus. <clears throat> and you've, if you've been out walking at night, you know, hopefully you're getting out a little bit, you've probably noticed Venus as well in the night sky. And Venus is waning. You'll notice here in this image that you've got a fantastic crescent in your view. And what we're seeing here is about 21% waning crescent, which means that 21% of the part of Venus that's in daylight is visible to us. And the rest of Venus, which is in nighttime, is facing us, though we don't see it because there's nothing to illuminate it. Now, when you think about observing Venus, you have to look towards the sun to see Venus. And when you look towards the sun, 
you're not going to see the entire sunlit area of Venus because it's closer to the sun than we are. This is also why you don't see Venus crossing the southern sky in the middle of the night like you do Jupiter or Saturn or Mars because Venus is closer. You have to, it's always somewhere around the sun. Now, as Venus is slowly moving around the sun or in its orbit, it is approaching a position where it ends up in between us and the sun. And that's called inferior conjunction. That happens on June 3rd this year. And up until that date, Venus is going to continue to get smaller and smaller into its crescent phase. Now, even though it gets smaller in phase, it's getting closer to us. So it's going to be a little bit bigger with each passing night in the sky. Now, these are images I've been capturing um, with Bob for the, the Brown University Physics Department. And... I've been capturing an image roughly once a week. And this week, we're going to start compositing these images into a sequence so we can see that progression of waning activity in the phase, as well as seeing the progression of how much larger Venus is getting. This image here, once it was completed, resulted in this view right here. And what you're going to see here is you have Venus and you have the, that beautiful crescent. And you'll notice that there are some colors in here. You have a little bit of whites and yellows and you got a little bit of blues. And the way we're capturing this using specific filters to isolate different parts of the light we're seeing. And note that this is captured in daytime. This isn't at nighttime. The blue areas are representing different features that we can see in that heavy cloud cover that surrounds Venus. Now, an interesting thing, too, is, and, in, in, you know, we're working from home. So I got the telescope set up in the yard. And when we get a clear day, I go out to shoot this. And my, my daughter, Unity, will come with me. And sometimes one of the neighbors pops over and takes a look. And I point out to them that if you look down along the top of the telescope, you can notice that Venus is actually visible to the naked eye during the daytime. And once you see it, you'll be surprised how bright it actually is. So you have about a month left to catch a good view of Venus in the evening. So if you're stepping outside to take a break from your isolation and go for a walk and breathe the fresh air, take a look after sunset in the, east, in the western sky. And that ridiculously bright object that looks like an airplane or like the aliens, that's Venus. Now, Scott, you said you took that picture during the day. So why is the background black? Magic, Derek. So <laughs> what's happening is, is we're in this image here. I'll bring it back up real quick. I'll bring up the, in this image, we're isolating two specific areas of the visible spectrum so one we're isolating the infrared part of the, the visible uh, the part of the spectrum it's not visible and then slightly into the visible spectrum which are the hydrogen alpha wavelengths which is on the very very edge of the red part of the visible spectrum or the low energy side and that's what gives us a nice stable image of venus and in those wavelengths you don't see the blue sky because the blue side of the spectrum is the other side. It's the high energy side. So the, so the sky disappears dark in the, in the image, which is one of the reasons why we want to use infrared. We use the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, and we're isolating these parts of the spectrum to capture the detail in the cloud deck. And when I capture the ultraviolet wavelengths, at that point, since it's on the blue side of the spectrum, I am dealing with a lot of background light in the atmosphere so i have to balance out the the ultraviolet frames when i process them so the background's not so bright because if you did that you would end up with a blue background on the image now gavin you had some images you wanted to kind of throw up gavin just stepped away for a moment so that's why I called out Gavin, because I know he wasn't here right now. I wanted to put him on the spot. So, so Scott, I've got one shot of Venus I'd like to share. Let me just... Absolutely. 
that timing of yours, Scott, was impeccable. It wasn't it. Yeah. Oh, that is amazing. Wow. What is the what is the phase yeah. here? So this was shot with the 16 inch mead at Barrett and Holly, and Venus was only eight degrees from the sun when this was taken. So it's in broad daylight. Um, when you're slewing to it, you want to make sure the telescope is capped until it reaches its target. You don't want to chance any um, the telescope sweeping over the sun on its way to Venus. So it's only 1% illuminated in this view. That's, That's beautiful. And you can see the ashen light, that glow that Venus kind of puts off. Yeah. Now, Barrison Holly, that's the that's the observatory that's on top of the the tall Barrison Holly building on Hope Street in Providence, right? Yes. Yeah. So if you guys are ever driving up in Providence and you're driving on either Brook Street or Hope Street and you get up to Waterman, right before you get to Waterman, take a look at the building and look up on the roof. There was an observatory up there. It actually looks like Frosty Drew Observatory on the roof of this tall city building. And that's the Barris and Holly Observatory. That's one of the observatories that Bob works in. Gavin's back now, Bob, um, Scott. So <laughs> Gavin, we were like looking for you. We're like, where did Gavin go? He's got pictures to show us. And I wasn't sure if you're gonna come back with empty ice cream cones. I, I have no ice cream cones, I apologize. <laughs> I do have pictures though. <laughs> so how about you show us some cool stuff? Okie doke. Um, so the collection I put together for this evening, um, it's uh, the theme is things that are probably close to naked eye visible or with a good pair of binoculars. Um, so the first picture we have here is of uh, the Pleiades, um, um, the Messier catalog object number 45. Um, this is an open cluster um, that is so close and so open that you'll actually see it as a collection of oddly bright and close together stars. Um, you usually see this probably into the fall, into the early winter. Um, and so in the picture here, you know, this is a very long exposure zoomed in. You can see that um, around the stars, there's what we call a reflection nebula. Um, and that's a cloud of cold gas that's just being lit up by these bright stars that are uh, in the middle of the cloud. Um, now, this so the Pleiades has a reflection nebula around it. But a reflection nebula is just hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas is what triggers or the mass component of star formation. This is a young cluster. So is that, I don't know, is that the same nebula that this star cluster formed from? That is an excellent question, Scott. Um, if I was a better astronomer, I would know that. Bob, can you answer that? I'm sorry, I was distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Ask the question again, please. So the you got the Pleiades here, and you got the reflection nebula at the Pleiades. Though the reflection nebula is just a hydrogen gas cloud, which is part of star formation. And the Pleiades is an open star cluster, so we're talking about a young cluster of stars. Is that reflection nebula the nebula that the cluster formed from? It is. That's um, it's that the stars are forming within that. But a lot of what we're seeing is reflection. Not, not a mission. Okay. Gavin, that is an amazing image, by the way. I love the detail you got in like the wispiness. Yeah, I was really happy with this one. Um, I believe I captured this actually out at Frosty Drew. It's. Uh, um, what did you use for optics? Uh, this is with the uh, William Optics uh, ZS seventy one. That's a three inch refracting telescope. Oh, it's beautiful. And did you capture that with your ZWO camera? Oh, yeah, this is one of my early ones. Yeah, with my, uh, it's a ZWO ASI 1600. Um, that's a, a camera specially designed for astrophotography. Um, but the sensor chip in there is the same one that appears in like a lot of Panasonic um, and related uh, mirrorless cameras. Now, this object is often mistaken for the Little Dipper in the sky. And it's got a common name. It's called the Seven Sisters among many common names that it has. And as you can see in this image, there's obviously more than seven stars in it. Though, this is not 
a constellation like the Little Dipper is. The difference between this and a constellation is a constellation looks familiar to us in shape, though the stars themselves have no real relationship to each other aside from the familiar shape they make for us. So it's pareidolia, so to speak. And if you got closer to some of these constellations, those stars would start to lose that familiar shape because of different distances they would be away from where you're moving to. But not the Pleiades. The Pleiades, all the stars in the Pleiades are related to each other. They all form from the same molecular cloud, so they're all the same age. And if you were to approach this cluster, I mean, it would take you a while. It's 445 light years distant. But if you were to approach it, you wouldn't lose the shape. You would just start seeing more and more stars until you eventually saw somewhere around 2,000 stars. And this is actually in the constellation Taurus. This is me shanghaiing Gavin's presentation. We like to pick on Gavin. It's not very nice of us. Fair enough. Uh, the one other piece of Pleiades-related trivia that I have is uh, in Japan, the Pleiades are called Subaru. And that's the Subaru logo for the cars is taken from the Pleiades. Um, but you know, might know earlier Scott referred to them as the Seven Sisters, but the Subaru logo only has six stars in it. And the reason for that is that in the lore of the Seven Various Sisters, one of them is hiding. That is the missing uh, star in the Subaru logo. So if you have a Subaru car dealership or work for one, visit that donate link just below the video in our description. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next object here, um, Bob showed a couple of images of this uh, in his wide field pictures. This is uh, the Andromeda galaxy um, captured with the same telescope. Um, and this is another object where um, very, it's visible naked eye. You'd certainly be able to see it with that um, simple pair of homemade binoculars that uh, Scott demonstrated earlier. Um, well, this is the. Three -dimensional. Hmm? It looks almost three dimensional. It looks like it's floating amongst the stars. Yeah, this is it's a very good object to get started with in astrophotography and even just casual observation because it's large, it's easy to find, um, and there's just you keep finding more details as you uh, get more refined in the hobby. Now, if you were to look at this through a telescope, is this what you would see? Um, probably not. Um, you're going to see first a fuzzy blob, um, and as you kind of adapt and avert your vision and that kind of thing. Um, you might be able to start picking out uh, some of the dust lanes and whatnot. Um, but there's, there's certainly a process to visually observing something like this. Yeah, now this. I think the, the like the the general rule of thumb is you need almost an, an eight inch refractor or sorry reflector to be able to see dust lanes. And then there's that cluster in the upper. I think in this picture, upper right, um, on that second dust lane that you can sometimes make out in a telescope. Now, this is naked eye visible from Frosty Drew Observatory, making it the only extra galactic or object outside of the Milky Way galaxy that we can see with our naked eye at Frosty Drew. This was actually a subject of some debate um, in the not too distant uh, past as to whether objects like the Andromeda galaxy were nebula within our own galaxy or if they were galaxies unto themselves. Um, and there was a lot of very good science that was developed to prove one way or the other um, where these objects are. And it turned out this is millions of light years away, uh, much farther than most of the other objects that we see in the night sky. And that's a great point too, because if you look at a lot of older catalogs, you'll notice that the Andromeda Galaxy is listed as the Andromeda Nebula. We did have a question here from Surfing1998. Speaking of constellations only appearing as they do because of our relative position to those stars, how many years roughly will constellations that we see today remain in that basic shape? I'm going to, um, we can field that question up, but I just want to say real quick, what's the name of that person? <laughs> so you know who it is, Surfing1998. That's Alan. Yes. Alan is one of our sky evangelists. He's one of our team members. If you've been to Frosty Drew, you've probably met Alan, especially during the summer at the door to the observatory, taking care of group pass management. And you will not forget Alan if you met him because he has the most amazing 
personality and the most contagious positive attitude of almost anyone I've ever met. So shout out to Alan. We can't wait till you start joining us on these live events. And now to your question. Anyone want to take it? I'll, I'll, I'll offer an answer. Um, so it, it actually depends on how close the stars are to us. Um, the closer the grouping of stars that make up a constellation, uh, the sooner their shape changes. Um, the only one I know offhand, I think, is the Big Dipper is going, is basically kind of in that shape for like the next 30 to 40,000 years. And then one of the stars in the Big Dipper is not associated with that group. Um, so it's going to drop out of that asterism and we're not going to have that nice handle and dipper formation. So if you think about like what Derek's saying here, this and Alan's question, stars move in the galaxy and they don't move like, but the, they don't move at the same rate that the planets do from our point of view. So we don't see changes as frequently as we do with the planets and especially not as frequent as we do with the moon. Though over thousands of years, these stars' movements, it's called proper motion, does change the star's position as it is viewable to us. And if you take a star charting application, something like Cart2 Cart Seal, and stick it into like a thousand year increments and then just hold down that advance button, you could watch the constellations kind of move apart. And if you start losing accuracy as you get way ahead, but it gives you a pretty good idea of how the sky will change over thousands of years. And if there are still humans here 50,000 years from now, the sky will look a bit different than it does for us. Right. What's next, Gavin? Um, so my uh, third image here um, is another nearby galaxy. Um, this is uh, Messier object number 33, the Triangulum Galaxy. Um, now this one is smaller and fainter, um, but still is a target you can access with a fairly um, low-end telescope or perhaps even a telephoto lens. Um, I don't know too much in detail about the history of our science with Triangulum in particular, but perhaps Scott has interesting facts to add. Well, the Triangulum Galaxy is part of the local group. So when you think about galaxies, when you think about the universe, galaxies tend to clump together and you have clusters of galaxies, which have smaller collections of galaxies that are in groups. The group that the Milky Way is part of is called the local group. The Andromeda galaxy is part of the local group as well. It's actually the largest galaxy in the local group. The Milky Way is the second largest galaxy and the Triangulum galaxy here you see is the third largest galaxy in the local group. Now this is slightly further away from us than Andromeda. Andromeda is about two and a half million light years away, where the Triangulum Galaxy is about three million light years distant. And these make up all the primary galaxies in the local group. And when we look at galaxies outside the local group, we see them moving away from us. And that's because of the expansion of the universe. And when we look at those, we see Doppler shift. Doppler shift is where as they move away from us and the light is coming towards us, the light doesn't slow down as it relates to the speed of light. The speed of light is static. So instead of it slowing down, the wavelengths get stretched out and it shifts it towards the red side of the spectrum. So we see more red than what's actually there. That's a very, 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 very brief description of Doppler shift. But in the local group, galaxies are not moving away from each other because they're so close. They're moving closer together because they will eventually merge. So when we look at galaxies like the Triangulum and Andromeda, instead of redshift, we see blue shift. Because again, speed of light, static, 186,000 miles per second. But as these galaxies approach us, the speed of light doesn't increase, but the wavelengths get more compressed. And the, the closer the wavelengths are, the more towards the blue side of the visible spectrum we see it. We had a question from Ken. He said, how did our sun form? He actually has three questions. So how did our sun form? How did our solar system form? And how old is our solar system? Anybody want to take that? I'll take it. <laughs> so you have, a, you have a, a series of questions there, Ken. 
So let's start with, with uh, I'm going to be brief here. Let's start with how the sun form. So to our knowledge today, we stars form from nebula, from hydrogen gas clouds in space. You get a disturbance in that gas cloud, and that disturbance, it could be anything. It could be a, another molecular hydrogen gas cloud mixing. It could be a supernova remnant moving through the, the hydrogen gas cloud. It could be the interaction with just cold hydrogen gas along the interstellar medium. Any one of these things that happens, it, if it creates a little dent in space-time, that's gravity. And once you have a little dent or a little piece of gravity inside or a region of gravity inside one of these nebulae, all that hydrogen gas starts to drop into it. Now, hydrogen or mass plus gravity equals heat. In this case, the hydrogen is the mass component. So in the center of that little dent in space time, the temperatures keep rising. And you eventually get to the point where you reach the temperatures required to fuse hydrogen into helium. When that happens, you have a substantial energy output that occurs, but gravity pulls it back in and you get a balance. And what that is, is a young new formed star. And that's how the sun formed. Now on your second question about the solar system, when stars form like this though, there's a leftover ring of debris that's, it's a remnant from the star formation that surrounds that newborn star. That's called a protoplanetary disk, and sometimes it's referred to as a solar nebula. And this is very, very small pieces of matter. You're talking stuff like smaller than pieces of dust, but these pieces are clumping together. And they eventually start to clump into larger objects like a meteor, and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they form these things like asteroids. And these asteroids start crashing into each other, and they form something called a planetesimal. And when this happens is orbits or visible orbits start to form around the star. When enough planetesimals start colliding with each other and coming together, they form into what we call a protoplanet, which is an object that starts to look somewhat round. It's not round like a planet is. It looks more like a very large asteroid, but it's starting to get enough mass and enough gravity to pull it in equally on all sides. This is called hydrostatic equilibrium. As more and more of these planetesimals connect with that protoplanet, eventually you form a dwarf planet. And that dwarf planet will either absorb everything else in that orbit or will eject it. And that's how planets form. And that's largely how the solar system formed. Now, there's a lot of things in between that that we're gonna skip right now. But at this point, based on the sun's current lifespan and its current stage in its cycle or its evolution, we date the solar system and the sun at about 4.8 billion years old. Now, Scott, um, you mentioned these planets kind of form from planetesimals colliding together. All of our planets all seem to have their orbits pretty well aligned, though. Is that just coincidence, or is there some other force that works there? Can you say that again, Gavin? I'm sorry. Um, all the planets in our solar system all kind of lie together in a plane. Um, now, if they were all forming from their own independent planetesimals, was it just coincidence they all wound up in a plane like that? Or is there some bigger organization at work there? So the planets will largely end up around the equator of the sun. And this is called inclination. The, the sun is the gravitational mass, or in this case, the sun. The star in any planetary system will be the master of the solar system. It's the gravitational master, and it's what organizes all the planets. So as the sun is in the case for the solar system, is spinning on its axis. It's pulling in all the matter around it, and its gravity is organizing it along its equatorial plane. Now, initially, the protoplanetary disk or the solar nebula is not as distinct as that plane is, and when you even look at the solar system today, the primary planets sit pretty close to that, that plane of the solar system. We call it the ecliptic. <laughs> But when you start looking at some of the smaller objects, you know, objects in the asteroid belt, objects in the Kuiper belt, objects in the scattered disk, these objects are not so distinctly along that plane. And they do kind of get into clumps like you would expect to see in a protoplanetary disk. And it's because the sun, though it is the master, the gravitational master of the system, there are other processes that are affecting it. And when you think about the Kuiper belt, the Kuiper belt is largely, even the scattered disk, organized by Neptune. If you think about all the planets in the solar system, Neptune is the one that is really kind of 
corralling all of these objects into one specific region. It's kind of like the enforcer or like the mommy and daddy. So we, I'm going to move the discussion back over to Bob. After we had that fabulous presentation from Bob showing off those constellations, the, the amazing use of that diffusion filter and the colors that you get in the stars, Bob's going to show you something else that he is amazing at. Now, Bob's amazing at a lot of things, but I think this is something that Bob doesn't realize he's amazing at, but it is really quite interesting. So we've all seen the ISS pass, and we pointed out a Frosty Drew, and everybody, they freak out because it is really amazing to watch humanity's only continuously inhabited space-based residency in orbit passing over. But Bob has figured out a way to take high-resolution photographs of the space station. And I'll let him explain to you how he does it and let him show you what these amazing images actually look like. Okay, hold on. Let's see if I can get that working. And Bob, remember, try to turn your camera on this time if you can. I'm getting the spinning wheel of death here. At this. Yeah. Live streaming hammers our laptops. I was thinking about dragging my entire data processing desktop out to the woodshed where I do my, most of my live presentations. But I thought that might be going a little overboard, especially considering at this point, my neighbor is always looking at the woodshed thinking, who the heck is this guy talking to out there in his woodshed? Just yeah. your hand truck. I can't seem to get out of it either. It's just hung up. We see your screen with a spinning wheel of death as well. So I wonder if the only thing I can do is disconnect. Um, I'll tell you what, if I can't get this going, it is late and I probably spoke longer than I anticipated on the first talk. I'm happy to do this next Friday. It'll be a fairly short talk. So, Well, let's do this. I'll bring up a couple images real quick and see if you can get it rocking and then let me know and then we'll switch over. How's that? Okay, so I may have to log out. So uh, That's fine. All right. So yeah. let's do this. My computer had a meltdown as well, so... I'm back. <laughs> Usually it's my computer that's crashing and it's become kind of a novelty every week, but this week I'm doing something different that may have solved the problem. So what I'm going to show, so right now we are in the, the time of the year when we see galaxies. May is considered galaxy month. And there's a lot of fabulous galaxies we can look at. So I'm going to bring up right now an image of a galaxy called Messier 64. Now, Messier 64, which is right here. So Messier 64 is a fantastic galaxy in the constellation Coma Berenices. Now, Messier 64 goes by the common name, the Black Eye Galaxy, and it's largely because of this little area right here, this little dark spot that we see. And this is a really interesting galaxy for a couple of reasons. One, it's 17.3 million light years distant. So when we look at this galaxy, we see it 17.3 million years in the past. That's how long it took for that light to get here. Now, this galaxy is about 54,000 light years in diameter. So it takes 54,000 years for light to cross this galaxy. And... This galaxy has an interesting process happening. So it is a spiral galaxy, though we see a very dense set of spirals here that kind of taper off into a much thinner area of spirals. You notice a lot of blue in this region. And those, all the blues you're seeing, those are young stars. But when you get into the central region, you have a lot more of the yellows and reds, which are older stars, but you also have this really dense dust lane right here. And what you're looking at 
is very potentially a galaxy that had a recent merger with another galaxy. And that second galaxy's hydrogen gas, all of that cold hydrogen gas, that dark dust, hasn't fully settled onto the plane of the primary galaxy and is still sitting just above it. So you're looking at a transitionary state during a galactic merger. An interesting fun fact about this galaxy is of all the galaxies we look for supernova in, this galaxy, we have never seen a supernova occur. Now, this is a really awesome galaxy to look at this time of the year. And if we were live observing tonight, this would be on our list of galaxies to show. Now, this wasn't actually discovered by Charles Messier. You know, it's in the Messier catalog. This was discovered by a French astronomer, or I'm sorry, an English astronomer named Edward Pigo. And he discovered it in 1779. Charles Messier confirmed it one year later. Now, here's another galaxy I'm going to show you. This is Messier 63. This is the Sunflower Galaxy. And the Sunflower Galaxy is right next to Coma Berenice. It's in a constellation called Canis Venetici. A little less, less known, it's right off the handle of the Big Dipper. And this is a beautiful spiral galaxy. This galaxy, we look at it somewhat tilted, so it's not on edge, it's not face on. And this galaxy is about 29.3 million light years distant. So this is, it's almost twice as far as Messier 64 was. Now, Messier 63 that is commonly referred to as the sunflower galaxy. And, I, you know, I guess it looks like a sunflower. But one thing to note here is this little dark area right in the front here. This is a dust lane that sits on the edge of this galaxy. And this galaxy has a very large, it's called, we call it a um, halo. It's a transparent bubble that surrounds galaxies and has the most distant, oldest objects that are part of the galaxy in it. The halo of Messier 63 is actually very large. Though you don't see it here, it would take up probably a good half of this entire image. You notice over here you have another small little galaxy in the background. I mean, there are so many galaxies out there that any place you put the camera into a long exposure, you will pick up galaxies in the background. Now, this galaxy was discovered also in 1779 by a French astronomer named Pierre Margène, and Charles Messier confirmed it the same year. Now, I'm showing you a lot of galaxies here because this is what we would be looking at this time of the year. But you know what I'm going to show you right now? I'm going to show you an image that we didn't capture at Frosty Drew. This is an image captured by one of the best imagers of the cosmos on the planet. His name is Damien Peach, and he's done some unbelievable photography of the cosmos. And today's astronomy picture of the day was Damien Peach's photograph of Comet C. 2020 F8 Swan or Comet Swan, which has been making huge waves in the media because of how amazing this comet is getting. So in this image here, this is Comet Swan. You have Comet Swan's nucleus, and then you have this unbelievably amazing ion tail coming off this comet. I mean, take a look at this thing. This is a taste of things to come. Comet Swan is currently in the Southern Hemisphere sky. It's in the constellation Telescopium, so you can't see it in the north. But today is the day it crossed the ecliptic. Remember the ecliptic, the plane of the solar system. And when it crosses the ecliptic is when it starts getting into the Northern Hemisphere sky. Now, being that it is on, or what we would consider Western elongation, so it's on the western side of the sky in relation to the sun. That means we have to see it in the morning before sunrise. Now, the comet's moving towards the sun. It's going to move around the sun. Uh, I think it's May 27th is going to be the comet's perihelion. And that's when it reaches its closest point to the sun at about 39 million miles. But just look at this tail. 
I mean, this is the best comet that we have seen in our sky in years. And we are about to see this in the night sky. This comet is currently naked eye visible. So gear up. We're putting the date at May 19th because the moon is in the sky still. The moon is going to be a problem. And since the moon's waning, it's moving into the morning sky. But once that moon gets into the thin crescent phases this May, we're going to see this comet naked eye. And it's going to get brighter. This comet keeps going through outbursts. Outbursts is when the nucleus of the comet, this region of the comet, the, that, that green glow you see on the comet, it's, it fractures right here. And when that fracture happens, you get a substantial amount of volatile elements and materials in this comet, and they become exposed to the solar wind. You know, this constant energy coming off the sun that moves through the solar system. It's magnetized. It's got plasma in it, charged particles. And it's heating up all these volatile materials, causing this green area called a coma to form around the comet's nucleus. And the more outbursts we get, the brighter this comet gets. We, we don't know enough about this comet to tell you where it comes from. We don't know about, enough about the comet to tell you its orbital period. But based on its outgassing, based on the way this comet's acting, this is probably a new visitor to the sun. It's probably an orc cloud comet. And this could become fabulous. So get excited about this comet. I am, if you can't tell. I'm freaking out. And I'm constantly complaining about how all these amazing comets are always in the Southern Hemisphere. And when are we going to get ours in the North? Maybe this will be it. How's everything going over there, Bob? Well, I'll give it a try. All right. Not sure if it's working. Is somebody else sharing that screen? Because I'm getting all sorts of funky stuff here. I am. Oh, there we go. Now you're up. Am I? Yep. We got it. Okay. All right, well, I'm going to just talk about taking some shots of the space station in a very low-tech way. I've noticed there's some amateur, I think, in New York that's been taking some absolutely fabulous shots with a C-14. And he has, um, I think, an EQ-6 equatorial mount. He sets it up as an altazimuth, and he has written some special software and he has guiding cameras that will actually lock onto the space station and the mount follows it. So I don't have any of that. I'm using a much lower tech version in order to get some shots. And this will end with a pretty interesting story, what this experience led to. So this was the telescope I was using for several years. I've since sold it. I'm using something else now. But... I actually made the mirror in this telescope. This is a 12 and a half inch F5. It's on a German equatorial mount. Incredibly heavy. And just, this was not a portable telescope. This stayed in the observatory. Takeaway from that, Bob made that telescope. Like he didn't buy it, he made it. Well, the mount is commercial. I repurposed it. There were parts that had to be fabricated for this. So there is a collection of commercial parts. I did have the aluminum tube formed, and I painted it. And, but I ground and polished and figured the optics in this one. Um, I'm currently working on a 16-inch mirror, and hopefully I'll have that done this coming winter. That, that's proven to be a real bear. But in any case, what's most important in order to get some shots, is to make sure your optics are collimated. You want to make sure you're going to get really sharp images because you're recording a very small object. Uh, make sure the telescope is well balanced because in my technique, you're going to be pointing the telescope just ahead of the space station, and you don't want it to move. It has to be perfectly balanced, so that's critical. You need to have either a Telrad finder or something else like it 
a nice wide field zero power finder that will produce a bullseye in the sky to help you aim at the space station. And you do not need a drive. In fact, when I took these shots, I, I left the motor drive off. So you could do this with a well-balanced Dobsonian. So I always would take a test exposure to confirm the focus. This was with an older uh, digital SLR and um, the newer mirrorless cameras. I'm using a Canon RA right now. The view screen can show this cluster, for example, live, and you can get a very good focus with it without having to take a test exposure. But it's still a good idea. If you have some time, aim at something, take an exposure, make sure you're happy with the focus. So for these shots, this is a picture of my son actually looking through the Telrad. The camera is mounted on the focuser. So it's at prime focus. There is no eyepiece involved. Just a camera body attached to the telescope. I've got the camera set to ISO 1250. And the exposures were one two thousandths of a second. I'm also setting up the camera to take continuous exposures when the shutter is tripped. So when I hit that shutter, it's going to just rapidly fire until I let go of it. And then you wait for the space station to appear, and you aim just ahead of it using the Telrad. So if you have not used the Telrad before, what it does is it projects a bullseye effect on a piece of glass that's angled. And I'll go back to the previous shot. Let me just pull up the laser pointer. So this is the Telrad, and it has a, a piece of glass that you look through. That glass is at a certain angle. I think it's like 45 degrees. And there's a LED that projects a, a bullseye, reflects off a mirror, and it goes up onto that piece of glass. So it's like a heads-up display. And if you aim into the sky, you'll see a series of concentric circles. And you just push the telescope just ahead of the space station. And you'll see it come flying through, and it happens pretty quickly. And as soon as I got into, like, the inner circle, I would fire the shutter and take maybe five exposures. And in each frame, the space station would be in a different portion of the frame. Some frames, it wouldn't be there. Then I would quickly move the telescope ahead of it again. Now, my earlier shots weren't really high resolution. This is with an old Nikon V70, only six megapixels. But I was able to capture the solar panels and some of the structure, some of the modules. That's and really I was, cool. I was pretty thrilled with it, to tell you yeah. the truth. And that, yeah. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Now, after I took this, I decided, well, how much can I see visually? So I have a little four and a quarter inch that I made when I was a teenager. It's an F5. And it's on a very simple mount, and I put in a low-power eyepiece. So it was magnifying maybe 25 times. And I aimed just ahead of the space station, and I was actually able to hand maneuver the telescope and keep the space station in view just by nudging it along. And at 25 power, you can actually make out the structure. I could see the solar panels. It was small, but I could see the components really incredible so give it a try if you haven't 25 power you can make out individual components so again i took some additional shots as another angle every time it passes over the angle to us to the observer is often different so you're going to get a different view of it it's never going to be the same yeah we we have managed to track it with one of the dobsonians that frosty drew a couple of years ago, uh, one of the astronomers and I, uh, I would push the Dobsonian around while somebody would look through the IP. It was pretty fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, and people are amazed by what they can see. So this is a prime focus shot. This is how it looks. This is one shot in one frame. But when you crop it, you start to see some detail. Wow. Oh, my God, that's amazing. So I'm not using any fancy image processing or any computerized mount. This is just a non-tracking telescope. 
I just want to see if you could do it. Just shoot prime focus, aim ahead of it. You know, and out of uh, maybe 15 shots, I would get five exposures that it showed up. Some of the frames I would miss. Here's another one I really like. So you can make out the solar panels. This is the Japanese module up here, the connecting truss. These gray structures are large radiators that are mounted on the station to dissipate heat. And this little white nub at the end, that was a cargo ship that was docked at the space station at the time. Wow, that's really amazing. Like I mentioned, there's a guy in New York who's taking shots that blow these away. I mean, it looks like NASA took them. It's just amazing. But still, you know, this is a lot of fun just to be able to see it like this. You know, but I think you need to be in those circles to actually be seeing those images because these, most of our visitors, they, they get excited when we post pictures of just a space station streaking over in the sky. But images like this, these are amazing. Like you're actually seeing the station components. Yeah, like you can that's them. that's fantastic. Again, this is the, the Japanese module. It's the large one. I can always identify it. And you have this long section that sticks out. And this one, I don't see a cargo ship attached to it. But you can definitely make out the gray radiators and the solar panels. Solar panel is always the way the light hits them. They always look uh, almost like copper, like a penny. Now, how far away is the station? It typically orbits fairly low. It's maybe 250 miles up. I get my best shots when it makes a pass nearly overhead, so it is very close to me. If it's um, closer to the horizon, it's far more distant, and you're not going to get a lot of resolution. So you want to get it when it's passing pretty much overhead. There are a few other shots taken back in 2013, different angles. And there's one I got that was fairly close. Now, in addition to favorable passes, the space station will travel at different heights, too, and they have to boost it in its orbit occasionally. So sometimes it's... It could be as closer to us by 25 miles, and that makes a difference. So you can make out a lot of detail on this. These are amazing. So just so you can identify, there's my one of my favorite shots, and just look at the detail on that. So this is showing some of the components, and you can actually cross-reference this. Here we have, I don't know if it was that particular cargo ship, but it looks like it could be. There's um, the European cargo ship, the ATV, and that might be that. Definitely these radiators, these big panels, they look very gray in color. That's what these are right here. And I pointed this out before. This is the Japanese module. You know, I'm kicking myself. I didn't try this sooner when the space station, um, the space shuttle was still flying. Imagine... Capturing that dock to the space station. Oh man, I I missed my opportunity. Yeah, that would be amazing. I just don't think it was possible to capture it in this detail unless you had a really big telescope with a computerized tracking mount to keep it in view continuously. I remember one night it had to have been mid two thousands, maybe late two thousand seven ish. Um, Space station and the shuttle were uh, orbiting. They weren't. They weren't docked together, but the space station was orbiting them ahead of the shuttle, and you just saw these two brilliant lights streak across yeah. the sky as a pair. It was. It was phenomenal. Yeah, I remember seeing it like that too, and that was phenomenal. So here's an interesting image. Another one I shot, but it's not the space station. I wanted to see what I could capture, so I got a little crazy here. It's not well resolved, but this is a very tiny object. You can see some white and some gray and a little bit of gold in that. It's this guy, the unmanned little shuttle, the X-37B. I use the same technique, and I believe what we're looking at with the gray is the underbelly with the thermal tiles. And when it gets in orbit, whatever payload it's carrying, it's always secret missions. But when they open up the payload doors, they extend um, 
solar panels that can be folded up and retrieved inside before it comes back for landing. So that golden that we're seeing are the solar panels. And on the back, we're seeing some of the fin structure that we see in the tail. So that was pretty cool. Now leading to my interesting story. So I've been taking these photographs for a number of years. And back in 2013, um, being the manager of the observatory, I get all sorts of interesting phone calls in my office. People often find what they believe in media rights, but they have always been media wrong. So I have not seen a real media right found by somebody. And usually I have to give them the bad news. But I got this one call, a young lady that was living in Providence at the time because her fiance was going to the medical school at Brown. And she mentioned that her brother was in town from Houston visiting. And they wanted to know if they could come to the observatory and see the space station because their dad was the commander on board at the time. So I said, absolutely, we can do that. I said, we can't use the telescope in the dome to look at the space station, but I can bring in my, my small four and a quarter inch reflector and we can take a look at it that way. And it ended up being on Valentine's Day in 2013. Now I sent her some of the photos that I've taken of the space station and she sent them to her father. Uh, that was Commander Ford, who was on board the ISS and in an earlier orbit, he passed right over Rhode Island and took this photograph from the space station. So we can see Beaver Tail Point, Jamestown, one of my favorite spots. We can see the Newport Bridge, the Jamestown Bridge, and then Providence is up in here. So this is on Valentine's Day, and you can see some snow on the ground in the spring. That's so, really awesome. So we got to exchange photographs, different perspectives. He got a shot of the space station. We got a shot of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And this is another photograph he took after he passed over Rhode Island, heading out over the Atlantic Ocean. So we're looking at Long Island here. This is Lock Island. You can see Narragansett Bay. Beautiful shot. Yeah. Low angle sun. And Commander Ford's the one with the rugby shirt. Mm -hmm. So, we're set up at LAD. Um, his daughter and son are there. I have my telescope on the rooftop. We're ready to observe the space station when it appears. And we're waiting. And the young lady gets a phone call on the cell phone. And it's a dad calling from the space station. He says, I'm over Texas. I'll be there in a couple of minutes. And two minutes later, sure enough, you can see the space station rising in the northwest. This was a more northerly pass. It wasn't directly overhead. But as soon as it got higher in the sky, we were able to get the telescope trained on it. And we were actually able to make out the solar panels. And his daughter's talking to uh, Commander Ford. And then they pass the phone to me. <laughs> so I'm watching the space station go by, and I'm actually talking to somebody on board. And it was uh, just an incredible experience. So later on, he sent me this autographed picture, uh, just thanking me for uh, allowing his kids to visit the observatory and witness the space station flying over on Valentine's Day. And he also signed one of my shots and sent this along. So it's uh, something I treasure. Amazing. It was a great experience. That is awesome. Let me just get out of that. Am I still sharing the screen? I am. Yeah. There we go. Bob, that was a fantastic presentation. I mean, those images of the space station are mind-blowing. The You don't think that you can see all that detail, and you see it passing. It just looks like a, a plane or a star in the sky. But it, it, it's funny, too, because you got a lot of people that don't believe in the space station. But I think those images definitely change that point of view as well. You run into people that don't believe in it. I mean, yeah, they don't, they don't believe it exists. Yeah, they think it's uh, it's fake. Uh, so, don't, but don't worry about them. Yeah, but that was <laughs> those those were those were amazing, Bob. And so, 
we're wrapping up now. This is the end of our, our broadcast for this week. And I want to say thank you so much, Bob, for coming on and talking to us about all these amazing things that you're doing. I mean, it's, it's a wealth of information and these images that you're showing are just, they're priceless, they're stunning. Fabulous work. Well, so. thank you all. It was a, a treat to join in with everybody. Hope we can do it again soon. Hope we can do it in person too. Oh yeah, absolutely. We are looking forward to those days. And again, for all of you guys that are tuning in, thank you so much for joining us tonight. If you, ha if you had a good night, if you learned anything, if you were inspired or if you just enjoyed being here with us, please visit the donate link that's just below your view in the description. That helps us to keep doing these types of events and it helps us get through these tough times and it keeps us open when we can open again for free stargazing nights every Friday night. Now we've been having a lot of discussions at Frosty Drew about what we're gonna do as we start reopening Rhode Island. And at this point, we are gonna have to make some adjustments to this summer's program, but we are planning to be open. We are planning to have events for you guys to come out and see those thousands of stars overhead, to see the Milky Way. And we're gonna be publishing updates as soon as we can on frostydrew.org. When you go to our page, you can see the little red banner that talks about our update as it relates to the current situation. Please check that regularly. If you see the date change on it from the last time you checked, that means there's an update. And we'll be posting to our social media as well. So please continue to visit us on Friday nights. We will offer a stargazing experience remotely until we can open again every week. We love seeing you guys here. We love connecting with you guys. And we'll see you guys all again next week. Good night.